Hi everyone, this is Rico Figliolini, um, host of Peace Recorners Live here in the city of Peace Recorners. I have a special guest today, but before we get to him, I want to say thank you to Atlanta Tech Park for being a sponsor of this podcast. We're here in Atlanta Tech Park in the city of Peace Recorners. They're like, uh, think of them as an accelerator or an incubator. There's about 70 companies that work out of this location, all high tech, innovative type companies. And uh, we're right on the Technology Parkway, which is Curiosity Lab at Peachtree Corners, which is also another big thing that's going on here. 5G technology driven through Sprint, mobile technology, IoT, the Internet of Everything. This is a, just a great place for any company to be situated in this area and to be able to work with a lot of other innovative companies. Um, our lead sponsor is Hargrave Fiber. They are a, a uh, business that uh, is, is crafts customized solutions for hundreds of businesses in the Southeast. And they deal with small businesses that are looking for affordable bundle services, as well as enterprise level businesses looking for a full suite of managed IT services. Hargrave Fiber customizes their solution that works best for your business. So they're new to Peachtree Corners. They're opening up in other cities. They work B2B, business to business. And if you're looking for a local fiber cable company to do your internet, your uh, voice and TV solutions, this is a company that is works on a local basis, but is in, in, in the Southeast. So now that we've done that, let me introduce our guest today, uh, Kibo Taylor. Hey, Kibo. Good morning. Good, morning. Good evening. Uh, good evening, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, depending on, on when you're listening to this. <laughs> but Kibo here um, is running. He's a Democrat. I'm a Democrat. Right? That's correct. And we're not hiding from that. So we're no, good. Not That's at all. That's a good thing. <laughs> so we're, um, we're running for, you're running for Gwinnett County Sheriff, right? That's correct. Excellent. So the whole idea of this podcast is to be able to know a little bit more about Kibo, about what a Gwinnett Sheriff does. Uh, what you expect to do out of it, and to also find out a little bit about your philosophy. So why don't you tell us, just tell us a little bit who you are. And what... Sure. Uh, again, my name is Kevo Taylor. Um, I always like to start out with the fact that I am a lifelong resident of Gwinnett County. Uh, one of the few that was actually born here in Lawrenceville, Georgia, yeah. uh, back when we had the old Button Gwinnett Hospital. So that dates me up just a little yeah. bit about how old I am. Uh, I've lived here in Lawrenceville, you know, other than just a short period of time here, there is for school, but uh, I've lived here in Lawrenceville practically my whole life. Uh, started with the Gwinnett County Police Department when I was 23 years old, uh, fresh out of school. Um, worked there for 26 years, uh, had a very uh, colorful career, I would say. Yeah, great career, it wouldn't change anything about it for the world. I retired from the uh, Gwinnett County Police Department back in 09, uh, 2009. Okay. But while I was there, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, work 14 years of the uh, 26 years I was there. I worked and I spent them in special investigations um, where I worked everything from, mm -hmm. you know, narcotics type crimes, organized type crimes, things such as that. Okay and um, got to spend some time as the uh, narcotics unit commander uh, there as a lieutenant and then I retired as the uh, as a major out of one of the precincts but I also retired as, as the first and only at that time highest ranking African-American in that uh, in the uh, history of the Gwinnett County Police Department. In a police department that really is not uh, maybe, maybe today it is, but it wasn't too diverse back then, was it? No, it wasn't. The, it, the diversity, um, I don't remember us having any Hispanics there mm -hmm. uh, or Asian officers at that time. There were three other African-American officers that was there at the pol uh, with the police department at the time that I was hired on. So uh, when I started, we had a total of six. Yeah. Out of... Probably at that time, we were probably about 150, right. 150, uh, maybe 200 men department. Men. Women men came women. later, I guess. No, they, had, they had women. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not trying to be no, uh, no, one-sided no, with no, it, but uh, uh, 200, it was probably between 150, 200 uh, sworn officers that was okay. there. Uh -huh. Cool. And you went, you said you went to Central Gwinnett High? 
Uh, I graduated from Central Gwinnett High School here in Lawrenceville. Yeah. And, and your wife, Linda? My wife, uh, Linda, she is from uh, Decula. Okay. Uh, interesting story about her. I met her in the first grade. The first grade, really? <laughs> in the first grade, that's correct. <laughs> uh, wow. That was before they had actually integrated the, uh, the school system here in mm -hmm. Gwinnett County. Mm -hmm. So we all started uh, school uh, in the first grade at uh, Hooper Renwick. Mm -hmm. uh, school, which is in Lawrenceville. So she was bussed over from the Cuba, and of course, Hooper Ringwood is in Lawrenceville, and that's where I actually. They met brought your wife right to you. Right to me. <laughs> and you didn't yeah, realize little that. did I know in the first grade <laughs> that uh, that's how it would be. Wow. And you have um, two children? We have two there? kids, uh, Keisha mm -hmm. and Justin, uh, and uh, my daughter in law, which is also my daughter, Christina. Okay. And they have two kids, and and uh, we're looking for a third one to be on the way here soon. You're so. looking, I'm, I'm assuming they're looking also, right? They're <laughs> looking also, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, it's good to have, I'm waiting for, I won't have grandkids for a while, I think. They keep telling me, kids keep telling me they're not gonna have kids, so. <laughs> I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> really? Hey, hey, so let me tell you how quickly it changed. I heard that too, and then the next thing I heard when he got married, they came in, they told me they wanted five kids. Five. I was like, I said, okay, I was hoping for three, but yes, you know, let's you. see how five comes out for you. But if you give me five and bless me uh, with five, I'm okay with it. Yeah, you know? I'm looking for the shooting for the moon. And oh, uh, let me tell you, they, they keep you young, though. Yeah. yeah. And, they, and they're the ones that you really want to protect. Too. That's correct. One of them, uh, Kristen, I call him my co campaign pain manager really? uh yeah if you ever go on to my uh on to my facebook mm -hmm. uh, you see pictures where we had the king's day parade back here this past monday uh -huh. and he was out that's with me and well, cool. and he was i think he had more fun than you know just about everybody else out there but he got to ride in the car got out of the car passed out <laughs> uh hand out lists and things such as that but we had a great time that's a, that's a cool that's a great way to bond with kids <laughs> oh, let me tell you it is it really is um and you your educational background um just to tally through some of the stuff you've got sure you went to mercer university i got my undergrad at mercer mm -hmm. uh criminal justice mm -hmm. um got my master's degree from columbus state university in public administration mm -hmm. cool and um May I also say something else too? Please go ahead. Yeah, it's uh, a conversation. I'm a, I'm a, I don't want to just be yeah. I'm a, I'm a pro, I'll, I always like to throw a couple of other things in. Yeah, I'm a proud graduate of the uh, Georgia Command College, class number ten. Okay, and uh, also uh, the uh, DEA Drug uh, Commanders Academy okay. out of uh, Washington. So, well, a lot of experience, that's for sure. Thank you. And a lot of street experience, I imagine, too. Oh, I spent nine years as an investigator. Nine of those 14 years was actually working cases. So. Oh, wow. And I imagine you, the stories you can tell <laughs> I'm doing that. <laughs> now, you have, um, did you play football? I did. You did. Did you enjoy playing football? I mean, but that was a while ago, so it's not like people worry about concussions now and stuff. But... You know, I tell people back in the old days when I played, and I'm dating myself again, mm -hmm. You know, when you came off the field, if you didn't have that transfer of paint onto your helmet, that was a sign that you didn't do anything. Really? So, you know, the more uh, paint that you had from your opponent's uh -huh. helmet onto yours, it showed that you had a better game. So, uh, but yeah. no, we didn't really uh, worry too much about that back at the time. But yeah. well, let me tell you what it did for me. Of course, I enjoy playing and, you know, I'm dealing with the uh, – you know, bad knees and backs and hips yeah, and everything else now. Yeah, but what it did for me was right out of high school, um, they had started an eighth grade program here in Gwinnett County. Mm -hmm. And I get a call from a guy one day by the name of Dick Hodges. And he called me up and told me, he said, look, you you know, I just got your, you know, your information mm -hmm. from uh, your head coach over at the high school, Tally Johnson. This is right after I graduated. And I'm like, okay, you know, what is this mm -hmm. about? He said, I want you to come on and coach football with me. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me, you know, cause <laughs> you know, I felt like I said, you know, when I was playing football, I couldn't even hardly remember the plays out there. You know, you'd be so <laughs> nervous out there on the field. But, sure. uh, but let me tell you, it was the start of something very profound in my life. Uh, I started coaching uh, on the eighth grade staff with this guy 
And uh, I've coached, you know, little league football in high school off and on since 1979. Any time that I had the opportunity between that really? to actually get out there and be involved, uh, you know, with these kids, with these youth, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I've done it. So, you know, sometimes I look at it as is my ministry. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I look at it as just my calling. Mm-hmm. Um have you found kids changing over the years? The, the fact that you've done it so long, have you sure. found that the attitudes changing a little bit? Oh yes, yes. You know, I've coached kids, uh, kids of kids that I coached. You know, uh, in a couple of situations, I've had the grandkids of a you know okay. of a player that I've had. Yeah, yeah you're really good. Here, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, I am. <laughs> I am just a little bit here, but but the thing of it is, is that you do see there has been a change mm-hmm. and. You know that the one thing that is constant in life is change. Um, from generation to generation with these kids, um, you have to be, you know, an agent of change is what I call it. I don't know what anybody else would call it, but you know, you have to help people through change, yeah. and you have to be willing to change and modify what you do yourself. You know, I know that some of my tactics out there. This I coached this last year, and I coached mm-hmm. an eleven-year-old group. And one thing that I noticed is, is that, you know, I really, you know, had to start to change my ways too, Mm -hmm. you know, and I've always been a little resistant to change, but this past year I coached with my son and he was more the easygoing guy, you know, and I was still that, you know, the one that was, you know, (laughs) that that tough old gruff guy out there. But let me tell you, when those kids, man, you know, they show you so much love. Mm. And that's the one thing that I, you know, I've seen that is that um, it's more so today than it was when I first started. They require more. Mm. They require more love, and they're not um, they're not ashamed or really? reluctant to show you back love. You know, it's you come in to practice. Hey, coach, how you doing? You know, how was yeah. your day today? You know. And they would ask you how your day was. And, mm-hmm. you know, I don't know if they were doing it just because the parents had told them that was a good thing to no, do. No, I'm but, sure you would figure but, that yeah, out. Yeah, but some mm-hmm. of them, you know, it's, it's legitimate. It's like they, they cared about you, you know, and how you were doing. Uh, short story, and I know I'm getting off on a lot. We've yeah. got a long way to go. But yeah. uh, I, I was having some bad knee problems out there. Yeah. And I was coaching with a cane this last year, and they would come. How you feeling today, coach? You know, how's your knee? You know, it's like it hurts, man. Can't you see me out here? <laughs> you see me, you know, walking and limping out here. It hurts, but, but uh, probably one of the best experiences I've had with that. Uh, this it's year. a good thing they didn't tackle you on the, on the <laughs> field. That would have been bad. So let, let's go down that a little bit because sure. you've been um, to can't, countless churches, missions, and pastors have endorsed you that's correct um so you know big question you know i come from brooklyn i'm Mm -hmm. I'm a a brooklyn italian catholic came down to the south became born again christian okay um reagan democrat or reagan although i'm not republican right now (laughs) okay i'm agnostic to some degree and i will choose my my uh my uh poisons better (laughs) but um faith uh, especially in the South, I find faith uh, drives a lot of things. So, how does faith work for you in, in what you do? Um, I am very strong in my faith. Um, I was raised Baptist. Um, we kid about the fact that uh, when I was coming up, man, we spend some days on Sundays all day in church, mm-hmm. you know. Um, yes. But it's your foundation. Yeah. And one thing that. Um, no matter where I've been, whatever is going on with me, uh, my faith has always been what has guided me, uh, sustained me, mm-hmm. you know, lifted me up, uh, brought me through some things, man, that I didn't think I was gonna be able to get through. Yeah, yeah. I, I always tell the story that when it was left up to me, I could uh, really put myself on a bad path. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, we all feel the same sometimes. <laughs> but. Uh, you know, but I also knew too that it was my faith that brought me back. Yeah. So when I got started with this, one thing that we talked about um, when we were, you know, sitting around talking about what does this look like? What is it that we're trying to get accomplished? 
And no matter where we went, whatever we did, who we talked to, um, it always came back to how you connect with the community. Mm. And what I've always known, man, is the people that have their ear to the ground that 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 can that knows what's going on in the community that can connect with the community is mm -hmm. your faith based leaders. So we um, we set it up to where you know we reached out to you know uh, some of the individual pastors. Most of the yes, the, a lot of the uh, individual pastors uh, cross faith, you mm -hmm. know and. And when we would talk to them and ask them, you know, what is important to them? You know, I didn't go in there telling them, you know, what was important to me. Right. I asked what was important to them. And almost to the man and, or woman, uh, it always came back to it was how law enforcement interacted with the community. You know, especially out there in parts of the community that never saw law enforcement right. unless they were coming in, you know, for a I'm negative sure. reason. Sure. So. Um, so that's what we did is, is we talked about partnership and in with, you know, faith-based leaders. Um, you know, I gave them my word that, you know, when I win, you know, mm -hmm. that this partnership won't stop, you know, we'll continue to have these conversations and make sure that, you know, that I'm doing my part from the sheriff's department to make sure that, you know, we give a, a, a better light or a more positive light of law enforcement. So let's go down that road a little bit because most people might not realize what a sheriff sure. really does. So, um, so why don't you help us out a little bit? So as far as what's the difference? Let's go through this fairly quick just to educate a little bit. What's the difference between a sheriff and a police chief or a sheriff's and police? Okay. Uh, police chiefs, all your, most of all of your police departments here in the state of Georgia is mandated by either a council or a commission. Mm -hmm. Uh, here in Gwinnett County, it is they're mandated by the uh, the answer to the uh, Gwinnett County Board of Commissioners. Okay. So the police chief is actually hired by the um, Board of Commissioners, and mm -hmm. their function is is for law enforcement, you know, investigative uh, uh, felonies, murders, just, you know, whatever. Crime. Yeah, investigating all types of crimes, traffic control. Okay. Um, uh, answering calls, mm -hmm. you know, responding to accidents, that type right. of thing. The Sheriff's Department is a constitutional um, position, mm -hmm. okay? And basically what the mandate of the sheriff is is to uh, run the jail, mm -hmm. okay, secure the courts, and to uh, serve warrants and civil papers. Okay. Those are the main functions of, uh, of the sheriff. Um, but one thing about it is, is that the sheriff has a lot of other discretions of other things that you can do outside of those mandates, you know, providing that your budget and your manpower, allows you know, it. allows or permits you to do it. Yes. Okay. We, um, as far as the, sh so the boundaries of the sheriff's jurisdiction uh, would be what? Well, I mean, you've statewide. already stated it. Yeah, statewide. Statewide. That's okay. correct. Um, qualifications to be a sheriff? Uh, you have to be uh, post-certified, I believe, or get your post-certification within a certain time period of you being elected. Okay. Uh, you have to go through the process, your record. Uh, you can't have felonies or, you know, those type of things. Right. Um, then you go through the election process, and if you're elected, then you, there's some other training that you're mandated to go through. All right. Let's get back to a little bit to why you chose that you want to, I mean, you retired, you're doing football. I mean, your life could be a little easier. Why, why do you want to be sheriff? You know, when you go back to talking about faith base, mm -hmm. I think I've been moved in this direction for a long time, and I didn't even know I was being moved in this direction. You know, it's just, yes. you know, you're kind of navigating through life. Um, I was happy, you mm -hmm. know, I was happily retired. Uh Got out, got to do some things that you know I had always wanted to do. Um, try coaching football at a higher level, at a mm -hmm. you know more of a professional level. Um, okay. You know we own a, a a fitness business on the side too, so you know I got to dibble and dabble in a whole lot of different things. <laughs> fished a lot, okay. but what I was seeing was saw some things taking place. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, started, I believe I would say that it started with the uh, Trayvon Martin shooting, mm. okay? Yes. 
So social media uh, drove some people out to make a lot of different comments about some things. And what I was seeing was people that was in law enforcement that was making statements mm -hmm. and taking on a particular attitude that I just knew for a fact that that's not the position that a law enforcement officer should be taking. Mm -hmm. Sheriff Conway made a statement, uh, and I think he, well, I don't think I know, he called, uh, made a statement about um, Black Lives Matter being a terrorist group. So he and I had a conversation about it, and, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I was just like, you know, look, you're the sitting sheriff. You know, if that is your thoughts, then that's your thoughts, but, you know, you're the sheriff for everybody in this community, and you know, making statements like that is not helpful to what this situation is, mm -hmm. is the, what it calls for. So back in 2016, mm -hmm. you know, we were having more and more incidents that were starting to come out. And I was very vocal, you know, about some things, you know, um, very critical about some, some positions that I felt like law enforcement was taking. And it wasn't just because of that. It was just things that I was seeing and hearing you know, from people that was that held those positions, and I'm like, that's not what this is about. Right. You know, so what I did was I organized um, a prayer vigil up at the courthouse. This was in July of 2016, and what we did was uh, we brought in you know clergy, faith based leaders, uh, law enforcement, and we got them together. Uh, we did a prayer vigil up at the court uh, up at the uh, the Justice Administration's uh, on the grounds there. And what we did was after they prayed for each other, you know, we took that opportunity for everybody to uh, meet a police officer, mm. you know, and what was profound about it was, you know, I knew some people, man, they brought their kids up there. Mm. And they were telling me, you know, hey, look, my kid is afraid of the police. You know, I said, well, this is an opportunity. And they got to see these police officers for who and what they really were. You know, there are people every day out here trying to do a job, you know, just trying to get home to their families and they were wanting to do the right thing. So from that, and I know that that's a long answer, but, you know, when you ask me, you know, that's that was the beginning of it for me. And it wasn't until uh, maybe about January, last mm. January, December, January, people were approaching me about running. And um, I finally made up my mind around about January that, you know, that I would do it. So here we are. And it takes a lot of steps, obviously. I think family and, and consideration with the family and stuff. Right? It does. Um, you have to have the support of your family. Yes. More before anyone else's endorsements. That's correct. <laughs> Um, it's a crowded field. Yes, it is. So, you know, being that it's a crowded field, what would you, you know, what differentiates you from, from the rest of that field? Well, all of my opponents bring certain things to the table, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in terms of education, in terms of experience. Um, uh, what makes me different is my connections with Gwinnett County. Okay. My roots are here in Gwinnett County. Mm -hmm. Um, the things that I've done outside of law enforcement is what sets me apart. You know, I can work across the aisles with Republicans, Democrats, mm -hmm. anybody, um, all social groups, racial groups. Mm -hmm. um, I just have that experience that, you know, with what I have done and, you know, um, the connections that I've made, it just makes me what I believe to be the stronger of the best candidate. And, you know, when we talk about, all of us talk about similar things. So what we want to try to get accomplished out here, but you have to be able to build those relationships, maintain those relationships mm -hmm. and uh, have the confidence of, of, of the people that you're trying to build these relationships with, if you're going to be successful out here. For sure. The, so you do have a lot of candidates out there running, and everyone has different issues that, mm -hmm. that's their issue, if you will, to a degree. Um, you've been talking a bit, little bit more uh, about collaborating with the DA, the police departments, on the, using the existing task force, not necessarily creating new ones, but collaborating with them on, on their task force um, with violent crime. But you've also mentioned uh, mental health. 
Substance Can I add abuse. something to that? Yeah. Yeah, ahead. I'm not opposed to creating new task force. Okay. Um, as I stated earlier, you know, I was the commander of the drug task force, so I mm -hmm. understand the importance of task forces. And what I didn't mention was, was that uh, I was also assigned to the uh, FBI drug task force uh, yeah. yeah, for a period of time. So I understand the importance of task force. Mm -hmm. And um, if we're going to get some other things accomplished when you don't have, you know, the manpower, if you don't have, you know, the funding, mm -hmm. task forces are the ways to go. And so the sheriff's department can work with them. We can. I can. Yeah, I'd already said that uh, long before that. I hear now that the governor is talking about uh, human trafficking. Right. But when I first started this, I talked about taking people that are participating in the in the two eighty seven G program now, taking them out of that program and, and assigning them to, you know, any type of federal task force or local task force that deals with human trafficking. And two eighty seven G for those people that may not know has to deal with the ICE. Um, get, taking illegals off the street, arresting them, and uh, essentially you're doing essentially local police doing ICE work without getting paid for it, but using local police to be able to uh, to do federal work. That's correct. Right? Uh, which causes problems also locally. I mean, it I does. know some people say, well, they're illegal; they should be removed, but. 12 million illegal aliens in the United States. I mean, you know, we're not, they're not all going to be shipped home. <laughs> no matter how anyone looks at that, it's just never going to happen like it's that. It's not going to happen. Right. And they're a big part of not only the economy, but of our community. You were talking about seeking, you know, I'm sure there were kids that may have been from illegal parents that were playing football, you know, that you might have dealt with. Absolutely. You know, I absolutely. Mean, there are um, people, right, Mike? Yes, and you know, and some of the kids, I didn't even know that they were coming from illegal parent situations like that until I got into uh, this race. Mm -hmm. and some of the best kids that I had, um, you know, that their parents had, you know, came here and they were not documented here. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, and I've spoken to some of them and they talk about how the hardship of it was. I didn't even know it. You yeah. know, I mean, I was going, had gone on back to doing my own little thing and, you know, right didn't even know what those situations was really about. But basically, you know, immigration is a federal, it's a federal law, it's a federal issue. And, you know, so when people talk about, well, you don't want to enforce the law, it's not that I don't want to enforce the law. I'm going to enforce what is mandated by the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. You know, and that is not mandated by the state of Georgia. That's an agreement that the current sheriff, Butch Conway, right. entered into with ICE. And, and that's also a volunteer agreement, right? Yes, it is. Right. So we don't have to. The sheriff's department does not have to enter that. They're not no. forced to enter that. They chose to enter that agreement. You look at, I think, uh, at last count, there was 90 agencies in the nation mm -hmm. that participated in 287G. Really? That's it? 90. Well, that, what, and, agencies uh, or counties? Or? Agencies. Agencies. Okay. 90 agencies, and three of them that I'm familiar with is here in the state of Georgia, maybe more. Mm -hmm. I had heard that there was as many as five, but I can, you know, tell you of three. Okay. So that tells you that it's not a mandated thing. Right. <laughs> it's, right. A, it's an agreement by yeah. choice. And uh, and that doesn't stop, you know, if, if, if the police arrest or you serve and you arrest an illegal that committed a felony, they will be deported. I mean, that's just the nature of they will, you know, you're not talking, we're not talking about uh, felons necessarily. The majority of who's picked up are not felons. They're not no. criminal offenders. Um, you know, traffic ticket, everyone gets a traffic. I got a traffic ticket once. I mean, I was going for a $3 Starbucks. I ended up getting a $100 ticket five miles over the speed limit. Like, really? And it was shot down to 30, but whatever. I always said uh, Starbucks is expensive. <laughs> yes, it is. That day was very expensive. Yeah. But um, so so that would be one of the things that you would, if you were elected sheriff, that would be one of the things you would remove. You, the, I've always the said that would be one of the first things that I would do is, is uh, you know, uh, take uh, the sheriff's department out of that particular agreement with ICE. Okay. The, the, some of the other things that you talked about also is, and I, and I see there's a problem with like businesses hiring people. There's ghost employees. There's not enough people to work restaurants and stuff happening all the time. How would you attract and retain 
qualified, but not just qualified staff, a diverse staff that represents the community. How would you do that? Sure. Are there enough people out there to do that with? Of course there is. Um, and I may get in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. You know, we talk about, you know, uh, how low that the unemployment rate is today. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they boast about the fact that, you know, that there's jobs here. But you got to ask yourself, what type of jobs are they? Mm -hmm. You know, and when you see people at a certain level that they're working two jobs and they still can't make ends meet, well, it's good to stand here and boast about the fact that I got jobs, but, you know, they're not making a decent livable wage on what they're doing. Do you think that the sheriff's is, department is paying enough for no, a sheriff? nowhere near. And that is, that's been legendary ever since I've been in law enforcement starting in 1983. Okay. But, you see, you know, one thing that they would come back and, and talk about uh, – well, we did a study, and the study says that, you know, money is not the most important thing. You know, good work environment, good supervision, good, you know, and mm -hmm. they give you a laundry list of all of the goods. And somewhere down toward the middle of the bottom is salary, okay, <laughs> and benefits. Yes. Which, you know, and I was like, you know, I said, no, you know, I'm a person out here. You know, when I started with the county police department, I was making uh, less than $13,000 a year. So right. money and salary was important, you know, especially when I started having kids. And I'm like, no. So what I say on that is, is that, you know, when you look at, and right now you use the city of Atlanta as, as, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as, as a comparative agency, you know, the city of Atlanta right now have a waiting list mm -hmm. of people trying to get into the city. And what happened was the mayor change their their benefit package there so atlanta is one of the highest paid agencies in mm -hmm. this area when it counties at the bottom mm. as large and you know and as good as this county is right. we're at the bottom and we got some of the most finest officers and deputies in the nation these these are some of the most finest individuals you'll ever see ever run across you know and i know that there's some bad things that happen from time to time mm -hmm. but for the most part, they deserve more. So in order to get the best, you got to give them the best. So we're going to have to look at these benefit packages out here, what we're paying people. Is it true what I hear that um, <clears throat> when a police, for example, they train through the police academy these uh, employees mm -hmm. or people that would eventually be police officers in Gwinnett, mm -hmm. but then all of a sudden after a year or two they leave and they, after they get some experience, they get the schooling, they're leaving to go to other counties better that paying is jobs. True. That is true. So we can't retain them. Either. We're not, our retention rates is, you know, when you talk about you got over 150 um, vacancies. So you have the okay. budget. Supposedly there's budget for it. They and have, you can't fill the budget. You can't fill it. So you would think the money's there. You can't fill it. So maybe you should pay a little bit more, reduce the amount of vacancies, and then you probably should be able to fill it. We could. Right. But I think it's it's going to take more than just a little bit. We're going to have to seriously okay. uh, consider uh, changing are, what we're looking at as far as the benefit packages. And, for and these are like to me, arms, um, the, uh, armed forces are the same way to me. I've heard stories where people they're in armed, uh, the services and they still might have to uh, get food stamps. Mm -hmm. They may still have to do uh, other services from the federal government to help them meet ends meet. They're in harm's way. The sheriff, police, fire, they're all in harm's way. I don't understand why we consistently at, try to pay them less. I think we, as a society, is looking at a lot of things socially wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. um, we don't take care of who and what we should be taking mm -hmm. care of. Um, there's no reason why, you know, a veteran should have to worry about being homeless. Yes. You know, or finding affordable housing mm -hmm. or uh, finding good quality health care. Yes. Okay. I mean, it's and not like it, it's almost a joke. It's almost right. like they know that it's bad. And so yet when we sit it. down and, and what gets me is, is people, man, they want to put up this front showing how patriotic that they are. But yet and still, you know, we got people out here and they want to, you know, oh, it's so sad that we have you know, vets and police officers out here committing suicide. Well, you know what? What are we doing to change some of the things? Or this, 
it, in addition to the outside mm -hmm. pressures that they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So you take a person and you put him in theater over there in war, and then he comes back. He's got to worry about, you know, where his family's going to live. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we yeah. we fundamentally have this thing wrong. And, yeah. you know, and when we look at, you know, even the healthcare situation, mm -hmm. You know, and uh, even for Gwinnett County, and I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. You know, in other countries, they take care of the elderly. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they make sure that they're taken care of. Here, it's almost like they don't want to, you know, once you're retired, they don't want to take care of you. So mm -hmm. they make, you know, your health care yeah. so high, mm -hmm. you know, and other things, you know, the expenses of it, you know, and it's just like, I put my time in, I, have you know, have served this county or this country, mm -hmm. and here we are now, you know, that I need, and there's nobody there for you. So, so it's, it's amazing that we constantly do this, not only with our military, but with the police and fire, and even mm -hmm. teachers. I mean, these are people that protect us. That's correct. And that spend more time with our children than we do. That's correct. And, and yet, we don't treat them well enough. We don't. Um, sorry, we could. That's, see. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just like, uh, that's out of that's side of that's outside of the uh, realms of the sheriff's department, yeah. but you know, but it's still real, yeah, you know. And um, and another thing too, you know, um, if I'm elected sheriff, I want to work with the board of commissioners, mm -hmm. and you know, if you got people coming into Gwinnett County that wants to, you know, develop homes, okay. What's wrong with a certain percentage of those homes being set aside for law enforcement at a reduced rate yeah. that we can afford? You know, that's interesting because I heard someone else talk about doing that with developers, mm -hmm. having them, if they're going to ask for rezoning, right, higher density, that they should really, because everyone talks about affordable housing, but the real trick is how do you force that into the marketplace? Because there are expensive places to live, and the property is going to be expensive unless you unless government can do something about it. And the worker that's going to be working your police force in a locality like Buckhead can't live in Buckhead. And they might yeah. be coming from Cumming, maybe, or somewhere else. You know, or somewhere I know that they have uh, somewhat of a pilot program like that that's going on over in uh, in the city of Atlanta. Okay, but. You know, what I'm talking about is, um, you know, being able to be, you know, more diverse in more different communities, mm -hmm. all right? So not just in, you know, an identified area, but anywhere that, you know, that you have a development mm -hmm. that, you know, we can look at, you know, getting officers there because, you know, it's safer. It, 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 sure. it, it's, it's a crime deterrent to have, mm -hmm either a patrol car or a deputy's car or, you know, just folks knowing that, hey, there's a, you know, law enforcement on the, in the community, right. you know, it's, that's, that's worth the money of having security there. For sure. And most yeah. police drive their cars home and stuff. And in Gwinnett County, uh, the police officers do, and most of the, uh, not most of the deputies, but the ones that are assigned in certain areas drive their cars. Okay. Um, I had last, last uh, about six, eight months ago maybe, uh, I had the, uh, last year actually it was, I spoke to a couple of Gwinnett Superior Court judge candidates and we talked okay. about technology in the, in the courtroom, how that would really make things work faster, mm -hmm. especially if you, have, if you could do sort of a FaceTime type of deal where you don't have to come down to the court, all we're asking for is a disposition of mm -hmm. moving things to a different date, there's no reason to take up court time for that, right? Okay. Um, how would technology, the internet, the approach to law enforcement in the past decade, do you think that the Sheriff's Department has gone far enough with the use of technology, or has it, or, or has it not? I mean, where, what would you do there with, in, with one the thing, um, uh, One thing that I did have a discussion with it was about the wait time that attorneys have to have or use uh, at certain times over the jail waiting to see clients. Okay. And part of that is is because of the shortage of manpower at the jail or maybe other things, mm -hmm. okay? But they talk about a wait time. Some of them has talked about it up to three hours, okay. having had to wait before they can uh, get in and get the interview of their client. Um, 
one thing I would like to take a look at as far as technology goes is, is that if there was a system, a secure system, mm -hmm. that we could put a client in front of uh, a camera or whatever it would be, mm -hmm. uh, and remote uh, that uh, you know that interface with their attorney, right. so that the attorney would have a, a set block of time. You know, at three o'clock on Friday, I know I got a time. You know, have my candidate. You right. know, in the pod, so that he can, you know, we can have um, a secure you know, conversation. Have stuff. a secure conversation, and I can, you know, do this interview with my client. Mm -hmm. That's a time saver. Okay. Um, now, with that, obviously, there's some complications there for privacy sure. and whether that that's that recording is deleted later and stuff, and not used for law enforcement. It wouldn't be or... necessarily a recording. Okay, right. it's not a recording. So it it's just a retained. video conference. Okay. Do you see any other uses, online uses, or do you see more online uh, crime that the Sheriff's Department may have to deal with? I don't know um, as far as what the Sheriff's Department itself would be. Um, I would like, you know, take a look and make sure that, you know, we have, you know, up-to-date technology as far as uh, inside of the jails, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the courthouse. Uh, you know, courthouses are becoming more of a target for... Right. You know yeah. certain uh, certain things, so you know you want to make sure that your technology is up to par there. Uh, technology around the courthouse, uh, okay. so that you can get you know more real time information in the event that you do have an incident either yeah. at or around the courthouse. Um, um, hmm. Yeah, I do see an upgraded need for technology. Yes. Okay, it's it's interesting. I mean, City of Peachtree Corners, for example, is putting in. Um, uh, license ID cameras mm -hmm. and also facial recognition cameras just to be used to be retained and possibly used in case there was a felony act or something like that okay. in the community so it, it is getting more of a, of a cyber you know uh, having cameras out there and, and uh, being able to track things that is normal. correct um, Fiscally responsible decision making, reducing costly lawsuit liability. That's one of the things that you you uh, you spoke about. I think. Yes. How would you speak to that? Then, as far as well, I don't know if you looked at the news, but back here a few days ago, uh, Randy Travis mm -hmm. was reporting on um, on a case of a lawsuit where a deputy was just arrested by um, the FBI, and he's being prosecuted federally. Okay. Uh, for force, excessive force on an inmate, uh, a mentally disabled inmate inside of the jail. Uh, one thing that he talked about was, was that he had checked on the cost because there's there's so many, I think there, right now we're up to about 75 plaintiffs that's involved in a law, in lawsuits over mm -hmm. there at the Sheriff's Department mm -hmm. for either excessive use of force, wrongful death, and uh, if there are some other ones, I don't know what the other titles are, but I do know right about now you got about 75 plaintiffs. That, Isn't that a lot? And that's, a, that's a tremendous number of people. Yeah. For a force uh, that has 250-odd people. Right. So, well, or no, no. I think, no, uh, no. yeah, they got almost 1,000 folks now. Thousand, okay. uh, but see, here's the deal. You know, when you look at not only the cost that uh, is costing the county attorneys to mm -hmm defend these lawsuits. You also bring in outside attorneys. And Travis reported that he checked back in August. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it, back in August, the amount uh, that the county had spent on these lawsuits with outside attorneys was over $500,000. Mm -hmm. So that's what, six months ago? Almost mm -hmm. six months ago? Mm -hmm. So you know that, that that tab is rolling, okay? We spend millions of dollars out here defending these lawsuits. And then if we lose, then you're paying out multiple million sure. dollars to these plaintiffs out here. Right. And it starts from the top. You know, when those lawsuits first started, he did nothing to change the, the practices of that rapid response team that was operating inside of that jail. So are you saying possibly training? Oh, bad, it's not, bad well, I mean, first of all, it starts with your hiring. Okay. Who, who do you have? Who do you have sure. in charge? Okay. Um, as a sheriff, who do I bring in and who do I put in charge? Uh, 
Okay. And uh, what is the mindset and the philosophy that we're going to go at? And how do we deal with conflict? And how do we deal with, uh, you know, with people, man, that are, that are, you know, combative or mentally challenged in right. there? You know, when you look at it, probably 85 to 90 percent of the people, man, that is incarcerated, you know, they have some sort of mental disability. Mm. You know, you think about who goes into a jail and start fighting. OK, so, you know, we got to have a better screening process of folks that are going in. Okay. You know, if there are services that we need to provide to people, you know, as far as putting them in special areas, you know, we got to train our deputies better with uh you know, more uh, CIT training, crisis intervention type training. This, then that, doesn't this also come back to paying more money, to paying the right salary base to attract the right candidates? It does. Job? But, you know, even to get those salaries up to par and to get the right people in, you know, you're talking about, you know, three to four years. Okay, so yeah, it may take a whole happen. term to get that. Sure. But what I'm saying is, is we have to change the culture of that place immediately. Mm -hmm. Day one, I've got to have a plan going in there to how we're going to reduce and how we're going to deal with conflict resolution inside that jail. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with uh, physical force? How do we report physical force? When do we use physical force? Right. Okay, and how do we evaluate fairly if we're using proper force? Okay, so I can't, you know, some people will sit there and say, well, you know, you got... You know, it's going to take you time. Well, yeah, you're right. It is going to take time, but I don't have time to, to sit back and wait until some of these things take care of themselves. we got to have a plan from day one going in the door. What are we going to do? How long is the sheriff's term? Four years. Four years. Four years sounds like a long time, but it's... It's a, in the blink of an eye. Yes. <laughs> You'll be like... Especially when you get our age, man. Four yeah, years go yeah, by real quick. Yeah, yeah. Especially and, when you're on a mission and you want to yes. change things. Four years may not be enough time to do it. Huh? Well, I plan... Hopefully, you know, uh, my plan is is to bring the right people in uh, from the start. And, uh, you know, change people that I culture. got the, the confidence that's going to hit the ground running. Yes. We've been uh, with Kibo Taylor talking about his run for sheriff. His background, where he's grown up, who he is, and his faith. And I'm glad to have you out Thank here. You. Thank I appreciate you. you coming out. So why don't you, normally I do this when I do candidate interviews, give, give us a two-minute uh, two thing, a two-minute uh, elevator speech, if you will. Ask for that vote. Tell us why we need to vote for you. For sure. sure. Um, and tell us when the election is, all that, and where okay. they can reach you at. You know, one more time, man. My name is Kevo Taylor, and I'm running for sheriff of Gwinnett County. The election, uh, I have a primary, okay, and the primary is in May, May the 19th, uh, 2020, this year, okay? I'm asking for, I need your support, okay? Um, I need for people that, if you believe in what we're talking about, and if you want to get behind my campaign, go on to my uh, website, go to my social media pages. If you like it, please repost it, okay? Um, spread the word out as best as you can. What I tell people is, is that, you know, if you support me, find me 10 more people. And then ask those 10 people to find me 10 more people. And, you know, it's kind of like the old chain letters, man. We're just going to keep it going. <laughs> but you can find my information at Kibo for, Sher uh, Kibo for Sheriff, and you spell out for sheriff.com. Uh, and Kibo is K-E-Y-B-O. Yes, K-E-Y-B-O, Kibo, K-E-Y-B-O, Taylor for sheriff.com. Um, then uh, I'm also on social media. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I believe you might even be able to find me on Twitter. I'm not real sure about the Twitter. <laughs> I know Facebook and Instagram for sure. I've, okay. tagged, you, I've tagged you on that one. Um, great. We've been with Kibo Taylor. I appreciate you coming out, Kibo. Thank, Thank you. you. And good luck with, with getting the word out and, and telling your story. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you.